morning. It is so good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, we want to begin in a very special way with a prayer of blessing for the Collins family. So I'll ask the Collins family to go ahead and be making their way to the stage for Mike Justice to say a few words and to say a prayer of blessing upon them. Well, it is a privilege this morning to get to make this introduction uh, since this is the, the first uh, connection to the College Church that Nellie Jo has, and we're thankful that she's asleep and giving her mom a break here as, uh, as we make this uh, announcement. She was born April 21st and came a little earlier than expected, so she spent the first four weeks of life in the neonatal intensive care unit at Arkansas Children's Hospital, but two weeks ago she was discharged home sooner than expected, and both she and mom are, are doing well, and we're thankful for that. You recognize her parents, uh, Charlie and Emily Collins, but Nellie Jo is really part of a very long lineage of uh, faith in God's kingdom, and if I counted correctly, she's carrying the baton for the fifth generation of folks who are connected here with College Church. Some of you will remember, those of us who had the privilege of knowing her, two of her great-great-grandmothers uh, who were part of us uh, for a while. Tom Howard, who is her great-grandfather, David and Beth Collins, grandparents. Uh, she's had, well, the Gerchicks, aunt and uncle, and cousins that have been a part of us over the years. So this is, is really pretty significant now to be able to invite her to be a part of all of this. Her name also carries significance, and you should know this, that Emily's grandmother's name was, Emily, uh, was uh, Nellie, and her mom's name was Joe. So she honors that side of the family as well. So this morning we're privileged to offer a gift of blessing and prayer for Nellie Joe and for her family, and will you join me now as we do that? Father, we're thankful to have had the privilege to know this family. We're thankful for all the memories of watching Charlie grow up among us. We're thankful that we had the opportunity to witness uh, the wedding of Emily and Charlie at Dakota. And even back then, we knew that their covenant marriage was going to guarantee a safe place for their children. And now Nellie Jo gets to be the first. We pray for Charlie and Emily that you'll give them enough sleep to be alert to Nellie's needs, that they'll have enough energy to keep up with her as she grows up, that they'll have enough time to teach her what you want her to know and enough patience to allow her to learn it. We ask you to give them enough support to make sure that they do not grow weary in raising her to be a light in this terribly dark world. Help us to help them to teach her well. And we look forward to the delight that Nellie Jo will bring to us as we get to watch her grow. And we pray that you will walk and talk with her all the days of her life. And that before too long, she will find a friend in Jesus. And it's his name that we ask this blessing. Amen. Good morning. Uh, thank you again for being with us uh, this morning. Let's stand for our first song as we sing Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages there is
You may be seated. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live.
Good morning. Good morning. Jordan has asked me to share my favorite scripture and lead a prayer this morning. So my favorite scripture is one that's extremely encouraging to me. It's Paul's prayer for the Ephesian Christians from chapter 3 of his letter, beginning in verse 14 through verse 21. What I'd like to do, though, is before we actually read that prayer, I'd like to read a couple of verses that are earlier in that chapter that kind of sets the tone. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And then after I read these uh, couple of verses, I'll start the prayer on behalf of the congregation, and then I'll end it with Paul's, uh, Paul's words. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe in the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this morning we just lift you up and we praise you for being our God. And we're just amazed that you call us your children, that we are going to have this inheritance from you. We're just amazed and we thank you so much and grateful for that. Father, we have several that are on our hearts this morning that we just want to lift up to you. We know that people have lost loved ones this week and we ask that you give them peace and comfort. In their, in their mourning. Father, we know that some that are sick and are having some kind of physical difficulty, we ask that you strengthen them and heal them. And Father, we also know that there are people who have recently been married or are planning on being married this summer, and we have some that have just recently had children. And we're just so grateful for those uh, marriages and for those children And we just want to express our spirit of thanksgiving and joy. Father, we just want to lift up our sister Leah. We know that she is walking through a dark valley right now with her family. And Father, we ask that you give her a special sense of your presence to know that you are walking right there beside her. Help her to feel the comfort that you can provide. And Father, as she exits this valley, Help her to come boldly and with confidence before your throne because of her faith and trust in Christ Jesus. And now Paul's words. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious and limited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now our glory to God, who is able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or imagine or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Several of you Uh, are familiar with Robbie Shackelford. Uh, Robbie Shackelford is the director at Harding University in Florence, Italy, for a very long time. He always had a saying that uh, students should wake up with a hymn on their heart. And at the time when I heard that, I thought that was rather cliche, and, and being a mature, I didn't understand the meaning of that until very recently. Uh, as Dr. Justice mentioned, uh, several weeks ago, my wife Emily was very sick. And uh, being 31 weeks pregnant, things got kind of scary. Uh, a doctor shared that things could even be life-threatening. And um, with things being as scary as they were, uh, doctors decided to 
uh, send Emily to Little Rock where she could get some more serious attention. And so they, they took my wife, Emily, uh, in the ambulance and I was trailing behind all alone in a car uh, with all of my crazy thoughts. And for whatever reason, I think the Spirit put this hymn on my heart. The second verse says, How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she gives. Of course, things were uncertain at the time. And so uh, the next part had a little more meaning. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she gives, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Um, means a lot. And you wonder sometimes why these hymns uh, are sung. It's for times like that. Um, because we can face uncertain days. Uh, my daughter can face uncertain days because he lives. We can face tomorrow. So let's sing together. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to love, heal and forgive, He lived and died, to thy my pardon, and empty
In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. I need to come down out here there. Um, what a great way to start this day today, um, looking at five generations of memories that so many people in this room have. And I'm really, my talk today is kind of about memory, so that was really a great way to kind of introduce it, uh, not to mention just it's always nice to see young families and their, you know, their new babies. Now, it's been seven days since we were here for all of us, and a lot of things have happened, some of them memorable, some of them forgettable, right? Some of those things um, you may wish you could forget, some we, you may wish you could remember. Um, one of the things that happened this last week was Memorial Day, and so I'm going to kind of discuss a little bit about memory and memorial, and we'll learn some Latin. Uh, most of you may not realize how easy Latin is. Um, the word memoria means memory, so that's not bad. Some of it's much, much worse. Uh, but Memorial Day literally is just a day to remember. 
But when you put it together in the form of memorial, it's basically remembering with some sort of monument or some sort of event or some sort of something done to um, help you remember. Now, I remember, remember, I can't help saying remember, memorial. So many words have the M-E-M in it that means memory. Uh, but it's not great to define a word with that word in it. So really, the whole idea of memorial is something to make you not forget. But from a positive standpoint, it's to um, remember. Right? Um, memorial Day, many of us probably had some kind of get together with our family. That's a normal occurrence for Memorial Day. Um, it's a day off, a three day weekend, everybody enjoys that. Uh, but really the real reason for Memorial Day in our country is to memorialize, once again, there's that root, all US military personnel that have died in uniform while performing their duties in some way. Um, a lot of people kind of confuse Veterans Day, Armed Forces Day, and Memorial Day. Um, Memorial Day is to remember those that never came home alive. Veterans Day is to remember those that have served. And Armed Forces Day is to remember everybody that's serving now. So we try to remember those that are serving, have served, and have lost their life while serving. Now, it's common to tell people thank you for your service because service is another very important word in um, my talk today. It's not inappropriate to thank somebody for their service on Memorial Day, but in reality, um, for me, I'm just as grateful for those that have lost their lives in the military as any other person that's not a veteran, because we should all be grateful for that, and it should all be the same for all of us. And at some point on Memorial Day, we should all spend at least a little bit of time thinking of that important meaning, because the um, sacrifice made by those people on Memorial Day also comes from a Latin word that many of you would be aware of, um, sacer, which basically means sacred. Right? And then the facere part associated with sacrifice then makes it something that is to facilitate. So basically, the word literally means to make holy. So a sacrifice is required in making something holy. When you talk about it from a religious context, it's usually something given that has importance for the benefit of others some way. Now, there's always that aspect of somebody accruing some sort of personal loss for the benefit of others, whether it be for religious belief, but for their beliefs in general. And so people are willing and to make a sacrifice to take a loss for the benefit of others for something they believe in. And that's really what it is. Now, we're here today to remember a sacrifice, obviously. Um, through John, God tells us that greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends, basically to sacrifice oneself. Um, it's estimated that as many as 41 million Americans have served in the military since the um, Revolutionary War. And of those, about 650,000 of them have died in combat in some way. That's a small percentage when you look at it, but Memorial Day is set aside to remember that day because it's significant and it's important, and the day is to make us remember. Not to remember the last Monday of a month, but to remember what that day signifies, just like what we do in here today. Some bread and some grape juice in and of themselves aren't that significant, but what they memorialize is and what they stand for and what they signify. Now, any loss of any human life is tragic. 650,000 people, that's obviously 650,000 times more tragic. However, all of that loss of all of those people that were willing to potentially sacrifice their lives for what they believed in do nothing to guarantee the long-term future of our country. It had something to do with maybe perpetuating our short-term visions and goals of our country, but it's just temporary. In a sense, it reminds me of the Levitical system of sacrifices where Animal sacrifices could provide a way for the uh, people of Israel to be forgiven for breaking the Old Covenant. 
and they could restore their relationship with God, but it was just temporary. It would always just be temporary. The sacrifices of men and women in military or animals, all of those are insufficient for what we needed a sacrifice for. The forgiveness of sins obviously requires a much more um, perfect sacrifice, as we know. This is addressed in Hebrews in chapter 10, um, 11 through 14. And every priest stands daily at a service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Continues, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now we do this on the first day of every week here as we commune together, sharing this memorial meal, remembering the ultimate sacrifice made by um, our Lord. Um, this is the only means that God could come up with to basically permanently and eternally remove our guilt from sin and the results of sin, the punishment of sin. Um, we'll follow the example today as said in scripture by Jesus in, um, when he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins let's pray as we um prayer minds to take the bread heavenly father we thank you for this day um, we thank you for this memorial we thank you for the fact that we have been created to have memory so that things that are important can be um, ingrained in us and become habit for us and we know that no matter how many times we do this, it never becomes um, something we do out of routine because the meaning is so significant. Uh, please bless the bread and everybody that partakes of it. Amen. As we prepare to take the, um, the fruit of the vine, we remember that God tells us life is in the blood, and we understand that, and we know that. Uh, Jesus was willing to give his life, to shed his blood in the sacrifice that he made for us. And the significance of this cup to us should always be um, something that is memorable. Let's pray. Heavenly God, um, we thank you at this time, too, for the willingness of Jesus to die for us and shed his blood. and for the plan that you made in eternity to cleanse us of the sin that you knew that we would fall to. Um, we're grateful for that, and we um, thank you for it. 
And please bless this cup and each of us that partake of it. In Jesus' name, amen. When we consider the amazing gift that God gave us with his son's life through the sacrifice to save us, um, it kind of makes it easy to transition into talking about giving back. Um, God gives us so many different kind of things, intangible things, tangible things, time, money, love, our resources, our efforts, our talents, all of the things that God gives us. Um, it seems like that of all these, giving back a little money is one of the easiest things to give. Um, I don't think that when we're encouraged to give that it's only referring to obviously our finances. But all of those belong to God and all of the things we have and everything we are is due to God and because of God and basically he owns it all. So whatever we share with him, um, I think that sometimes that's the way we put it, but really um, he's sharing some of it with us, not really the other way around. Um, as we consider our personal offering today, because he tells each of us to give, so individually everybody should consider what they give. Um, I'll be reading from Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Uh, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things and at all times, you may abound in every good work. The reason he gives to us is so that we can give to others and so we can do the things that he expects of us. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the blessings you give us so many things, even the air we breathe right now, all of the molecules that hold us all together. Just, it's unbelievable if we really think about the things that you give us, our lives, 
Um, we pray at this time as we just consider what we can share back with you of what you've already given us, uh, that we can always be willing to share um, all of the things and some of all that you give us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart, every word. Tell me the story of Jesus, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell me the Are dismissed. Would you please stand for our next song as we dismiss those involved with children's worship? I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine.
please be seated. Hear me when I call, O oh God, my righteousness, unto Thee I draw in weakness and distress. O oh, my trembling hand, let helpless I shall fall. Oh, hear me, Lord, hear me. Oh, hear me when I call. Good morning. good morning and welcome. It is so good to see each and every one of you here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. As the month of June begins, it is both warm and rainy all at the same time. So I think maybe our next act of evangelism could be merely to open our church doors and let people come inside to avoid the heat and the rain. I think we'd multiply maybe 10 times just by doing that. We are grateful to Nick and Kevin and all of those who are responsible for keeping our building dry and uh, the right temperature. But another reason why people might want to come inside these days is because a revival is going on here at College Church. It began two weeks ago as we decided we wanted to follow Josiah's example. We wanted to commit our hearts, our souls, our minds to seeking the Lord. We want to get rid of the idols in our life clear way in our temples so that God could dwell. We heard the word of God, and as a congregation, we committed to following the scriptures, and we celebrated together. Last week, we learned that the early church started in a similar way. They heard the word of God, and 3,000 of them repented and were baptized to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And then they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in fellowship, in worship, evangelism, and in service. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. All of this is in order to fulfill 2 Chronicles 7.14. Can we say this together? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Do you still believe that? Then revival can continue. This week we want to look at the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel as he challenged the prophets of Baal and Asherah to a showdown for control of culture. And don't you know we're in the same battle today? Everywhere you turn, someone is trying to sell you on a different God. The God of power, the God of pleasure, the God of long life, the God of health, the God of wellness. But as long as these gods are out there, if these gods are not the true one God who provides eternal life, all of these gods can give you is limited power. We're in a fight for culture. Now, there are many who are serving the one true God. They see the source of power, but there is a division in politics, in our homes, in our own personal lives. And there's no one who knows this better than Elijah. We need to listen to Elijah this morning in order to find healing for our land. Will you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18? 1 Kings 18. Now, Elijah was a prophet in the 9th century, about 60 years after the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom divided politically. Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom at the time. His capital was in Samaria, which his father Omri had established there. Believe it or not, Ahab was not the worst king of Israel until he married Jezebel. A little backstory on Jezebel. Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of Sidon, way up in Phoenicia. He was fully devoted to Baal, as you could tell by his name, Ethbaal. He also named his daughter Jezebel. So when Ahab married Jezebel, he set up an altar, a temple to Baal in the capital city of the northern kingdom and called all of Israel to come and to worship there reversing the tide of what Joshua and the children of Israel had done in driving out Baal worship. Now it was coming back in because of one person, one family, one decision. And to make matters worse, their children, Ahab and Jezebel's sons, Ahaziah and Jehoram, and their daughter, Athaliah, ally and marry into the southern kingdom. In fact, Athaliah is the only queen of Israel or Judah, bringing Baal worship into the heart of the southern kingdom in Jerusalem. All because of one family, Baal worship comes from Phoenicia into the northern kingdom and then into the southern kingdom. A warning for all of us. This is why God raises up Jehu eventually to destroy the house of Ahab and Jezebel and anyone who is associated with them. But before that, he raises up Elijah in hopes of causing Ahab and Jezebel to repent, in hopes of saving the nation from further condemnation. When Elijah arrives on the scene, it's as if from nowhere. He immediately pronounces a drought that will end up lasting three and a half years because Baal was the god of rain. So God did not want it to rain until everyone knew that he was the true God. Then he could send the rain. So when Ahab sees Elijah after these three and a half years, he says, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And Elijah says, I'm not the one who's troubled Israel but you and your father's house by serving the Baals instead of the one true God. Let's decide once and for all who is the God of Israel. You get all 450 prophets of Baal together and the 400 prophets of Asherah, Baal's wife or sister according to some traditions. 
You call out to your God, and I'll call out to mine, and the God who answers by fire is the true God. Because a God who doesn't answer is no God at all. I'm going to say that again. Because a God who doesn't answer is no God at all. Which brings us to 1 Kings 18, verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Now, this might sound like a delicious mountain, Mount Carmel, right? It's actually a mountain right there in the northern kingdom between Phoenicia and Samaria, just like Ahab and Jezebel coming together. This was considered to be Baal's mountain, just like Mount Sinai was considered to be Yahweh's mountain. So Elijah is giving the Baal worshippers home court advantage. In fact, he lets them go first, so they're both the home team and the visitors. He gives them every benefit to show that their God is real. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Now, our translators are very helpful here. They give us a capital L for Lord, or in some translations, L-O-R-D, or all in caps, to indicate that the Hebrew term behind this is the personal name of God, Yahweh. Elijah says, you call out to your God, I'll call out to mine. Decide this day whether it's Yahweh or Baal. But quit limping between two different opinions, hopping as it were. He's playing off a dance that they would do as they performed for their God, jumping from one side to the other side, trying to get their God's attention, much like I just got your attention, right? You probably wish you had your camera out to film me hopping my workout for the morning. The idea is we need to get our God's attention so that he will then help us. But Elijah says, quit hopping between two different opinions. Decide. Don't just serve Yahweh when it's convenient for you and then Baal when he's convenient for you. Choose you this day whom you will serve. This is a real charge for us today. Not just to serve Yahweh on Sunday and then Baal on Monday. To give God part of ourselves but leave ourselves open to some of the gods of this world. We can't leave a foothold for any other god. We must choose and follow the Lord. Quit hopping between two different opinions, but the people did not answer him a word. That's important because the whole point of this challenge is for God to speak first. They want to know who the true God is. Then they will answer him. And the world is in the same boat. They want to hear God for themselves, and many don't think that God has spoken yet. They want to hear God, and then they will answer. We need to let them hear God through us. But they, at this point, did not say anything. So Elijah sent to the people, saying, I, even I, am left as a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, Elijah had every reason to believe that he was one of the last prophets of the Lord. Jezebel had been slaying the prophets of Yahweh. We find out at the end of this chapter that he has to reestablish the altar of the Lord because people had not been worshiping him in a long time. In fact, in the very next chapter, Elijah goes on the run from Jezebel to Mount Sinai, and he says to God, I am your last prophet who has not bowed the knee to Baal. But even though he believes he is the last one following the Lord, he is still willing to risk his life, to stand up and speak up for what he believes in. Some of you may be the only follower of God in your family, You may be the only follower of God at your school, at your workplace, on the playground. Are you willing to speak up, or will you let others think that you are just one of the prophets of Baal? Edmund Burke and Thomas Jefferson are both attributed with saying that all it takes for evil to triumph is for evil men to do nothing. It's not enough to do nothing. We must speak up. We must say something for the Lord. They were silent, 
But Elijah speaks up. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose their bull, but put no fire underneath it. He knew their tricks. They would lay out food and drink, but then eat it for themselves and say that it was Baal who did it. So he says in this challenge, do not put any fire underneath it. It must be fire from above. Just as the world sells us their products, sells us their promises, telling us that we'll get all these good things, but putting fire underneath us, rather than showing us fire from above. Don't let the world give you fire that's not from God. No fire underneath it. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And why not the God who answers by rain? They needed rain after three and a half years of drought. But if God had sent rain, they would have praised Baal. Or they would have considered it a coincidence. So God had to send the fire first. Then he could send the rain. But the real point of this is the God who answers. The indication of the answer will be, in this case, fire. But they want to get an answer from their God. Our world does not care about a God of deism, a God who created the world but is no longer involved in it. Nor are they really all that concerned about a God of the afterlife. You might invest a little bit in that God just in case. But they want a God of this world, a God of the present, a God who can help you today, a God who answers you now. This is why I've said it before and I'll say it again. We need to share our faith stories to tell people about what God is doing in our lives right here and now. Because when they see that, they'll begin to see where God is in their life. And they'll serve the God of today. And then realize that's where they came from, and that's where they're going. The God who answers, in this case by fire, is God. And they said, this is well spoken. He lets them go first, and they cry out from morning until noon for three to six hours, calling out for their God, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Because Baal is not alive, he cannot give them anything, any more than our products, our promises from the world. And it's sad There was no voice, no one answered, so they limped around the altar. That is, they tried to animate their God. They tried to give power to it so that it could then give power to them. The altar that they had made. No God that we make has made us. No God of our hands is able to heal our whole bodies. No God that we salvage together is able to save us. They cried out to a God that they made and then asked that God to save. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder, for he is a God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself or he's on a journey or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. Elijah is doing what Proverbs says to do. Answer a fool according to their own folly. Show them the error of their ways. If you believe in a God who needs to eat, who needs to drink, who needs to go on vacation. This God has limitations. He cannot help you. You need a bigger God. You need a God who is eternal, a God who is all-loving, who is ever-present. Only when they realize that their God cannot save will they turn to the true God. So they cried out louder. They cut themselves as was their custom. They raved on until the time of the evening offering. They were doing everything they could, trying a new drug, trying a a new promise, hoping that doing more of the same thing would give different results. But things that come from us cannot heal us. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Not Baal. Not Asherah. Not even Yahweh yet, which is sad. As they call out to Baal, Yahweh has to sit by. God has to wait until they turn to him, because if God had provided the fire or the rain, they would have thanked Baal. As much as we are crying out for healing, 
crying out for fire, crying out for rain, if we're not looking to God, if he were to give us that healing, we might end up keep doing the same things. And so he wants to turn our attention toward heaven. Now, after they've tried everything all day long, all the things that might be able to bring them healing, they're ready to listen to the Lord. So Elijah says to them, now come near to me. All the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. He took them back to their vacation Bible school days. He showed them the altar they used to worship at. He took 12 stones according to the number of tribes back when they used to be united. He reminded them that their name is Israel, wrestles with God, to try to bring them back to when they were one, though there was tension. He says to them, dig a trench, and the trench is going to hold about three and a half gallons of water. He said, put the wood in order, cut the bull, pour water on it. This is in the time of a drought. Pour it twice, pour it three times. So much so that the trench is filled with this water during a time of drought. But this is going to be important water for this purpose. And then... He prays a very simple prayer. He doesn't dance around. He doesn't try to get his God's attention because Yahweh is already there wanting to act. He he says a prayer very close to the prayer that Jesus prays when he raises Lazarus from the dead. He says, Lord, I know that you always hear me, but I'm praying out loud so that when you answer, they will know that you are the true God and that you have sent me. And when he has said this very simple prayer, God acts immediately, sending down fire from heaven that consumes the offering, which was the competition, but then also consumes the wood that was soaked in the water, consumes the stones, which are made of stone, and licks up the water that's in the trench around it to show that this is no ordinary fire. This is fire from God like what Song of Solomon calls the fire of Yah. So powerful, it cannot be put out by many waters. This is the power of love at work. And when they see this fire, they say, Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. Then the rain starts. The rain couldn't have started until the fire fell. And the fire couldn't fall until they were looking toward heaven for Yahweh to act. And they weren't looking to the heavens for Yahweh to act until there was a drought. There is a drought right now spiritually. But we have to be looking to the right source to provide that fire and that water in order to find that healing. You know, the last time fire came down from heaven was in Acts 2, when the cloven tongues came upon the 12 apostles as they spoke in languages to bring people to God. And before that, fire came from heaven in 2 Chronicles 7, when Solomon dedicated the temple and God accepted it as a place for his name to dwell. 14 verses after that, he says... If my people, that's all of us, who are called by my name, that is Christian, will humble themselves, stop dancing between opinions, will pray and seek my face instead of the idols of this world, and will hear, uh, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, God, the same God who sent fire and rain, I will forgive their sin. He will purge your sin, but also with the rainwater, wash it away, and I will heal your land. Both the fire healing and also the water that can wash and nourish our land. But get this, Elijah says that, uh, James says, Elijah was a man just like you and me. He was human. He prayed that it might not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and it rained. The prayer of a fervent, righteous person accomplishes much. 
Now, I don't know if this means that if I pray this week for God to not let it rain out my son's baseball tournament, that God is going to do that. I'm still going to pray that prayer. But I do know that what it means is that if we right now pray for a revival, we pray for God to send fire and then rain, he is more than willing to grant that request. Now, for you, that might mean later today going into your closet and asking God to give you that revival. It might be coming forward. Maybe some of us need to do that to call upon the whole church to help us. Maybe you just want to pull somebody aside afterward and ask them to pray for you. But our prayer this morning is for God to heal this land with fire and rain to change our culture. This morning, if you need to come, please come as together we stand and sing. I stand to praise you, but I fall. May be seated. What a wonderful morning of worship we've had this morning. Uh, I want to thank everyone that that led us in our time of worship. Um, thank you, Jordan, for that wonderful message, and thank you, uh, Charlie, for leading the singing. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning and are looking for a church family to call home, we would love to talk to you and, and connect with you and, and let you know about College Church. Uh, if you want to connect with us online, you can go to our website or you can uh, look in today's bulletin for a way to do that. Uh, we'd like to extend our sympathy as a church family to the Holt family. Um, Linda Holt, mother of Clifford Holt, passed away on Tuesday, May 28th. Prayers are greatly appreciated for this family. Uh, Melinda was in David Bang's shepherding group. And as far as services, uh, the funeral will be at 3 o'clock on Wednesday of this week at Powell Funeral Home in Bald Knob. So uh, if, you, if you see the Holt family, I extend sympathy and just show love to this family as they deal with this difficult time. I want to remind you about VBS coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, registration is now open. Uh, you can go to the web address on the screen in front of you. Um, it will be June 16th through the 19th. It's hosted here at College Church, but this is a collaborative event with downtown Cloverdale, Westside, and it's just a really awesome event that the community churches uh, get to come together and put this event on for our children around the community. And so uh, register at the web link on the screen. This is for ages three through entering the sixth grade. Uh, we also need an abundance of volunteers. Um, for various things. So if you are going into seventh grade and older, you can also at that link, there's a, a place for you to sign up to volunteer at help at different rooms. Uh, I know we will need 
some of our teenagers to help up in the teen center with the older kids. And uh, there will also be an adult class each night and babysitting will be provided for, for children under three um, to go to that and their parents can go to the adult class. And uh, you can, I think, I think I covered everything on here. So uh, reg register your children, sign up to help volunteer for VBS June 16th through the 19th. Uh, we want to welcome some new members with us this morning. Bob and Debbie Roper have moved from Michigan. And so we are, are y'all here this morning? Are right, the Ropers, if you would, uh, they're right here. Y'all don't mind to stand up. We'll welcome you to College Church. So meet with the Ropers afterward, get to know them, get to know their family, uh, and welcome them to College Church. We would also like to welcome back uh, a former member who's moving back to the Searcy area, Sue Balswell, who's moving back from Texas. Sue, are you here this morning? Over there, okay. So let's welcome back. And we are so thankful for everyone that is here this morning. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, I believe, Darren Matthews is going to come up for a quick announcement. Cheryl, all right. Let's all stand for our closing prayer. Will you stand? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the lesson that we've heard today about the spirit of Elijah and the great courage that Elijah had. <clears throat> My prayer, Father, is that each Christian here today <clears throat> will revive the spirit of Elijah in their life. And as they go forth, they will have the courage to tell others about your word and about salvation. We also, Father, pray for our country. We need people 
in positions of power to have the spirit of Elijah to stand for what is right and moral in our country. And we pray, Father, that as the election approaches, that the spirit of Elijah will be in every person to have our country turn around again. We're thankful, Father, for this lesson and for this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.